Why don't you look at somebody and say, this church is crazy. Now say crazy about Jesus. And say, this church is crazy. Crazy awesome. You know, for some churches, this would be all they would do. And they would just go home. Somebody said something powerful. All they could stand. Yeah, I like that. Because some churches, this is so outside the box. They're uncomfortable giving God permission to take over. But that's our goal. We're not uncomfortable with that. We're not here to go through the form of tradition and ritual. We're here to say, God, interrupt us and do whatever you want to do. Because we're, we're just human trying to connect with your deity. Don't, don't get uncomfortable. So today is the last Sunday that I'm going to preach the unfinished concept. I will do my best to be finished quickly. 15 minutes. Let's see where I'm at in 15 minutes. So hurry to your seat and open your pretend Bible. Because most of y'all just use the screen. All right. How many think I can be done in 15? Did you take this for me? Somebody say unfinished. Unfinished. Did you know the picture of George Washington on your $1 bill is actually an unfinished engraving, painting? The particular artist was commissioned by George Washington's wife. And he began to do a painting. He was supposed to do one of her and him. And he decided midway through that it looked pretty good. So he did not deliver it to the Washingtons and started selling them for $100 each copy. (laughs) Many years later, it became an unfinished portrait of George Washington and made your dollar bill. Don't be deceived. The unfinished is powerful. You know, the beauty of an unfinished story lies in the potential to become anything the author desires. Hope is the thread that weaves together the pages of an unfinished book. It is on the blank pages that are unwritten where often the conclusions and the most powerful stories occur. There's mystery in the unfinished. The first Half of your life often hints at promises and possibilities. But the unfinished talks about greater things on the way. Every story doesn't always find complete closure. And often the journey is enough. Your unfinished story, this is what I believe about you. Your unfinished story will ignite someone else's faith and imagination. So say this with me. Say, Jesus did not come simply to make me better. He came to finish your life. Mark 8 tells a unique story about a city and a man and disciples. And the chapter of Mark 8 is truly marvelous. It speaks of a city called Bethsaida in verse 22. And there was a blind man there. And the scripture says that some people brought a blind man to Jesus. Say some people. people. You better have the right some people around you. You have the wrong some people. The King James says they. NLT says some people. But they're unnamed, they're unknown, they're unspecified, only that these individuals who were inhabitants of Bethsaida recognized this man needed a miracle, and they are the unsung, unacknowledged heroes of the beginning of the supernatural. Because if you have the wrong people in your life, they take you to counseling, they take you to social media, they take you to the psychiatrist, they get you on drugs, but you get the right people in your life, they take you to Jesus. 
You, you really need the right people around you. Your circle needs to be filled with the kind of people that say, your story isn't finished, but God's got a great conclusion in mind. You, you have to surround yourself by people who believe the best is in front of you and not behind you. So if you don't surround yourself with the correct individuals, you will frustrate your own destiny. They begged him. Look at those scripture. Some people brought this man. So he seems to be an unwilling participant in the supernatural, at least superficially. He seems to be uninterested, but it is his friends who recognize the need and they plead, they beg, they petition with Jesus to touch him. Let me tell you something. Your petitions to God can be the beginnings of a miracle for someone in your family. Don't you think your prayer doesn't make a difference? Don't you think your burden, your, your petitions, your begging, your pleading doesn't get the, the attention of Jesus Christ? You are the inception point of someone else's deliverance. That's why spouse don't quit praying for your spouse. That's why a parent don't quit praying for your children. That's why kids don't quit praying for your parents. Why? Because you can create the momentum that brings the supernatural to someone else's life. Jesus then took the man by the hand, let him out of the village. And then he does a unique way of healing, which perhaps we'll discuss. The miracle is rarely about what you've lost. It's always about what you have left. And this blind man is not the only individual that's blind here. He's a blind man living in a blind city, apparently. Surrounded by 11 apostles that are blind and blurred and stumbling and struggling. So, so I've, I've, I've typically preached this text one way, and I realized just recently that I have a math problem. Or maybe it was a perception problem. Or a misunderstanding problem. Because I used to preach this sermon about the second touch. And I would fixate on the idea that Jesus touched the man, and he spit in his eyes, and then he asked him if he could see, and then he touched him again, and he could see. And I would talk about the first touch being when Jesus touched him, and he said, I see ministries walking. And I would talk about how he touched him again and his eyes were open. And I said, there's a first touch and a second touch. And what I was preaching was foundationally true, but I had miscounted. I had overlooked something. Because I didn't realize what I was calling the first touch was actually the second touch. Because the first touch came when they brought the man to Jesus for him to heal him. And Jesus then took him by the hand. You see, Bethsaida is used to people being healed. They were used to seeing Jesus perform supernatural. And so these individuals within that city brought him to Jesus for Jesus to heal him. Who are they? We don't know. But make sure you surround yourself with those kind of people. Amen. Don't, don't, don't surround yourself with emotional vampires. Who pull the blood out of your spirit and the faith out of your soul. Who sucked you dry of anything positive. But get someone around you that fills you with faith that anything's possible. I, I know you have people who like to offer solutions. And I know there are people who are in complete chaos but they're experts on everyone else's problems but their own. You don't need any more of those. You need someone who will be determined enough to make sure you get to the altar when you're in trouble. When you can't see a way out, they'll walk you out is what you need. And Jesus takes the man after the petition of these unknown people and he takes the man by the hand. That's the first touch. And nothing happened. Jesus touched him and he's still blind. What is it and what happens when you know that he's touched you and nothing about your condition changed? How do you respond when you're touched by Jesus Christ and you're still in chaos? When he takes you by the hand and yet you didn't get your miracle. 
This man has heard about him and the people have promoted this faith that when you get in contact with Jesus, everything's gonna be different. But when Jesus touches him, nothing occurs. His condition remains the same and he leads him out. Nothing changes outwardly, but inwardly there is a connection. An investment has been made. The storm is still raging, but now a relationship of trust has begun. Your body is still racked with pain, but a connection happened. His eyes are still blind, but he's in process. He cannot see what's going on, but he can feel the power of the alliance. Just be with me for a moment. Understand this. The first touch of Jesus Christ was never intended to heal him. That was not the purpose behind the connection. And perhaps we, as individuals longing for a finished work from God, have misinterpreted his interaction with us. We thought the first touch should have brought me fully out, should have transformed me and healed me, but the first touch was more about separation than it was about completion. Because true deliverance requires separation. We don't like the idea of being separate. We want new wine in old vessels. Mark 2 and 22. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. For the wine would burst the wineskins. And the wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. The first touch that Jesus has with this blind man, this interaction, this alliance, this connection was simply to bring him out of an environment of doubt and negativity. You say, Pastor, I don't get it. Matthew 11 and 21. What sorrow awaits you, Corazon and Bethsaida? For if the miracles I did in you, this is Jesus talking, had been done in wicked Tyre and Sidon, their people would have repented of their sins long ago, clothing themselves in burlap and throwing ashes on their heads to show their remorse. Jesus said, if what I have done in you, Bethsaida, I had done anywhere else, those wicked cities would have transformed by the power of the miraculous, but you've resisted. You want my gifts without a relationship with the giver. You want my blessings without a connection uh, to my burden. And so Bethsaida, for Jesus to perform the supernatural in this man's life, there was a requirement in this particular individual that he bring him out. I'm here to tell someone there must be a disassociation and disconnection from your old ways. From your old habits from your old thoughts and your old environments. So the first thing Jesus Christ is gonna do is bring you out of what you're caught in before he can open your eyes for you to see what's next. Before he can begin a work in you, he's gotta bring you out of an old thing. No wonder the new birth tells us uh, that we have to be born again of the water and the spirit. I have to come out of something before I can walk into something. Uh, I have to leave my old thoughts behind behind, my sins, my habits, my customs, my thinking, my mindset, my lifestyle, before I can walk in to the fullness of his life. Understand, we want a breakthrough, but we don't want to have severance. You don't get miracles on your terms. If you want a new thing, you got to let go of an old thing. Jesus is leading him out of a city that has become so calloused to the moving of the supernatural that they look at it as something that's not simply ordinary, but something they deserve. I never want this church to get so satiated and so satisfied with the supernatural that we lose our hunger for building relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't want us to become so comfortable with the supernatural that we take it for granted. Granted, oh, you hear me. Every breath is a gift, and every every moment that the Spirit moves in here, we don't take it for granted. 
I don't know if you feel this way, but when the spirit started moving, I couldn't do anything but weep over here in the corner before I walked up on the platform because I don't deserve this. I didn't earn it. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. We don't, it's not the program. It's not the songs. It's the goodness and the mercy of God. That's why we feel what we feel at this church. Jesus said, I'm going to come up here, Jared. He said, I'm going to bring you out, blind man. Before I can give you sight, I got to bring you out of the way you used to think. I got to bring you out of the negativity that surrounded you. Let's get you in an environment where nothing exists but faith. I wish someone in this house could understand the deliverance you're seeking requires separation first. The Holy Spirit you want to receive requires you to leave some sin behind. You first repent. You're baptized and you're filled with the Spirit. There's got to be a turning away. But we want a miracle and we want to live in Bethsaida. Not me. I'm like, lead me, Lord, I'll follow. Take me wherever you want to go. Take me by the hand. There must be a disconnection from the disaster and the decadence and the wickedness that is Bethsaida. So I ask you, what are you holding on to? Who has your hand? Who's leading you? What's in your headspace? Listen. Mark 4, I like that because that's how it starts in the NLT. Listen. Listen. A farmer went out to plant some seed and he scattered it across the field. And some seed fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil, and immediately it began to grow. But because there was no depth to the roots, it died in the hot sun. Verse 7, other seed fell amongst the thorns. And it grew, and it choked up the tender plants, and they never were successful. Still other seeds fell on good ground, on fertile soil. And they sprouted and grew and produced a crop. 30, 60, 100 fold. Hear me. Listen. That's what the scripture said. The issue is not about if the seed's good. The issue is the ground good. Because you can sow good seed on bad ground and there is no growth. And I'm going to tell you something. All of us are one of those types of ground, often within the same service. We come in and the worship starts moving and we're good ground. We get a text and we become bad ground because the cares of life choke out the ability of the seed to take root. Hear me right now. You better focus on finding good ground. Good ground in your spirit, good ground in your soul, and good ground in your mind. And the reason Jesus says, come on and follow me. Let me lead you out. Because he said, "If I, that's why. Read the end of the miracle. He said, don't even go back into the village and tell them what happened. Because if you go back in that negative place, they will analytically try to undermine your faith and the miracle I did. Don't even share it with them. They don't deserve it. You got to get in an environment where the seed can fall in good ground and produce the right result. I want to come out of what I'm in so I can become all he has declared I could be. Good seed cannot produce in bad ground. So leading you out is a process. Submitting to the hand of Jesus Christ is necessary. Because leading you out makes you uncomfortable. Standing up here not knowing what to say, looking dumb, makes you uncomfortable. But that's what it feels like when Jesus leads you out. You can't see. The man is blind. He doesn't know where he's going. He gets no input. Come on, we're going to walk outside of town and then I'm going to lay hands out you on there. We get the benefit of reflecting because of history. He doesn't even get instructions. He just grabs him and starts walking. Can you walk with Jesus when he doesn't tell you where you're going? Can you trust his hand when he doesn't tell you there's a miracle on the way? Can he lead you when you're blind? Can you walk with God in the shadows? Can you walk with Jesus in the dark when he grabs your hand and said, I ain't telling you nothing. I'm just waiting till you leave the old way behind. I'm waiting till you think different and worship different and act different and believe different. Come on, son. Let me tell you something. The miraculous requires submission to the hand of Jesus Christ and it takes separation from the world. So I'm going to ask you again. Can you trust him when you don't know the details? Can you follow Jesus in the dark? Can you feel your way through it? 
Can you walk through a period of darkness without a miracle and still be faithful? And still be submitted? And still be believing? Can you be faithful even though nothing has changed in your life? That's the test. That's the test. When you came to Jesus because you needed a miracle. And he said, well, let's take you somewhere you've never been. And you go, but, uh, but, but what about the miracle? Well, what about, I'm, I'm a chatterbox. I'd have been asking all kinds of questions. Where are we going? <laughs> Why are we leaving town? I feel like we just walked through the exterior gates. Did we, did we just go down Broadway? <laughs> are people looking at us right now? Do we look weird? I mean, I'd have been asking a thousand questions. And the scripture says he didn't even talk to him. It doesn't, it doesn't say anything. It's just that he took him by the hand and led him out of the town. Can you walk with him even though nothing has changed? Lead me, Lord, I'll follow. Anywhere you want me to go. Let me see your wisdom. Show me things. I've never seen before, and I'm messing up all the words. <laughs> but there is always an element of blind faith, Jared, before there is ever advancement in the kingdom of God. You don't get the miracle without walking in the dark. But I have, I have, I have a word for someone. Stop panicking. Jesus has you. I don't know. There's an old hymn that I, when I was writing this, I started singing it to myself. I don't know who holds tomorrow, but I know who holds my hand. I don't know where I'm going. I don't understand the why. I don't understand the how, but I know who's got a hold of me. I, 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 let me I, I'm just telling someone, Jesus has you, stop panicking. Jesus is leading you, stop worrying. Jesus has got you. And, and you need to pay attention to how Mark 8's written. The man doesn't grab Jesus, Jesus grabs the man. You want to know why? Because my grip can be broken, but not Jesus. My grip can slip, but God's grip don't slip. God's got a hold of you, and God's trying to lead you out. Stop fighting it. Stop resisting. Stop hesitating. God's got a grip, and God's grip don't slip. Pretty good. Come on, give Jesus permission to lead you somewhere you've never been right now. You're blind to the details. You don't know where he's taking you. But trust his purpose. Trust his hand. If you can feel God's hand on your life, why don't you raise your hands and give him praise right now? The first touch of God is designed to pull you out of whatever you're in. God, pull me out of the wrong stuff. Keep my feet from going the wrong direction. Keep my mind on the right path. Keep me out of negativity and fear. Keep me away from bitterness and offense. Keep my footsteps pure. Lead me out of Bethsaida. If it's not going to let me be what I'm called to be, get me out of it. Get me out of the mess. Get me out of the toxicity. Get me out of the fear. Get me out of the negative reports. Get me out of the anger. Lead me out. Somebody needs to ask him in this service right now. Jesus, lead me out. Lead me out. Away from the naysayers. Distance from the doubters. Lead me out, Jesus. Lead me away from those people who only know me by what I am. The blind man. Connect me to people that see what I can become. Open something in me. Because when God finishes you, the definitions others put on you will not remain. When God writes your story, ah, I don't, what, what do you need God to lead you out of right now? God, if there's sin in this house, lead us out of it. Lord, if there's rebellion in this house, lead us out of it. If there's stubborn in this house, lead us out of it. If there's idolatry in this house, lead us out of it. God, I got to come out of what sin tried to catch me up in. Lead me out. So many people I know want a miracle, but they don't want to leave anything. Oh, God, take me where I'm supposed to go. Just walk this way, son. Walk this way. I'm taking you somewhere I can perform something in your life that would be impossible in the environment you're in. 
This church keeps trying to pull people out of tragedies and pain and chaos and confusion, but, but you're still holding on. You're holding on to things from your past. And the Spirit sent me to tell you, if you want the unfinished to become finished, it's time to let go of where you used to be and come into something new. But you got to let Jesus lead you out. It's the first touch that begins the supernatural. He touches him the second time. He puts spit on his eyes. It's an unconventional way to deliver him. It's insulting. It's frustrating. And I'm not going to dwell on it because I've already missed my 15-minute mark. But can I just say this to help you? Every touch has a test. And you cannot enjoy the benefits of the touch if you're unwilling to take the test. And I'm gonna tell you, you can't sit up under this kind of ministry and not go through something. You don't get to hear about Jeff Mallory's miracle, about the cancer not being in the bone marrow, not being in the blood, not being in the mantle of his body that is inexplicable. This is NIH, the National Institute of Health, the number one research hospital in the United States of America saying, we don't know what's going on. We don't even understand. I'll tell you why they don't know. Because God is inexplainable and inexplicable. God has no explanations, but you don't get to hear that. You don't get to see 65 people baptized in one service. You don't get to be in that kind of environment of faith without the enemy coming in like a flood and the Spirit of God having to raise up a standard against it. you got to come out of some stuff to walk in your purpose. This isn't for your entertainment at Tampa Life. This is for your transformation. And every touch has a test. And you know what the test is? I let you lead me. And now I'm going to be honest. Can you see? How many people believe Jesus didn't know? So why did he ask him a question he already knew the answer about? Because the test was, will you properly analyze who you are? Will you fathom the depth of your own faith and relationship? And will you be honest with me or will you keep pretending? Because the blind man was better, he just wasn't finished. And I am not content to just be better. I want to be whole. I'm not content to just be blessed. I want to be transformed. I'm not content to just walk in blessing. I want the favor of God on my life. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm not where I should be, God. I see, but I don't see clearly. I see, but I'm so mixed up. I see, but I got blurred vision. I'm blurred. Forgive me. Get me right. I got to see clearly. And the truth is, that is exactly where a lot of Christians live. In the blurred stage. They've been let out by the Spirit. They've been touched. But everything's a little blurry. It's not clear yet. And can I say something? Stop making definitive life statements when you're in a blurred stage. I'm not what I used to be. I'm not what I'm going to be. But it's blurry right now. Stop moving ministries based in the blur. Stop making life choices when it's blurry. Because you can't make decisions about your future when it's blurry. I've seen people kill their future by decisions they made in the blur. You'd be surprised. If I take my glasses off, I can see you. It's just blurry. And you wouldn't want me to shoot an apple off your head right now. But there are people shooting apples off people's heads and they can't see a thing. I know what color you got on. Sort of. But I can't see the details because I'm in the blurred stage. I can preach with my glasses off, but you wouldn't want me with a bow and arrow and an apple on your head. Because it wouldn't work. Do you know every time you make a decision in a blurred stage, you're trying to shoot the apple off someone's head without your glasses on? That's the best way I know to describe it. I asked the Lord to give me an example and he gave me a dumb one. But you got divorced in a blur. You got remarried in a blur. You left town in a blur. You sold a house in a blur. You walked away from a job in a blur. You quit ministry in a blur. How 
dare you in your blurred self try to pretend like you know what's going on? How dare you when it's all mixed up try to say what's going on? <laughs> you, you, listen, it, what God is testing us about is are you willing to be honest and authentic with yourself and say, I don't have a clue what you're doing right now, but I trust you. I, I don't know. I'm better than I was, but I'm certainly not what I'm supposed to be. So get me right. Make me clean. Get me away. You have to remain motionless because you're in the blur. And I don't know whether I should move or I should stay, but I have learned there is dangers making decisions in a blurred stage. So I just pause and I wait for a clear word from God because if I move in the blur, I'll move in, in something that I am not called into. So hear me right now. Don't let the enemy push you into making a decision when you can't see clearly. Hear me. Humble yourself and get honest and stop acting like you can see more than you can see. The test of the second touch was about honesty and being clear and authentic with God. This man doesn't try to act like he can see. He goes, I, I can't see. I'm better than I was, you know, when we were in town. But I see people and I see trees and I can't tell the difference. It's only that one moves and one don't. That's the only way I can tell. I was driving the other day and I handed my, my glasses to my wife for her to clean them. She goes, you are terrifying me right now. And I go, I can see. Sort of. And then accidentally I hit the brakes and I didn't really mean to. Because the people slowed down abruptly in front of me and I overcorrected slightly. And she hollered and handed my glasses back like rapidly as possible. She said, why'd you do that? And I go, well, I just, I didn't do it on purpose. It was a great joke, but I didn't do it on purpose. I did it because I couldn't see. I couldn't tell how far away they were. But our thoughts and our ideas are shaped by the environments we're in. They blur our visions. No wonder Jesus has to bring us out and then confront us with what we really can see. Blurred vision kills opportunities, destroys families, limits ministries. It breaks husbands and wives. You can't pastor yourself. You can't lead yourself. You're at a blurred stage. We quote scriptures to ourselves. We make little posts and we lie to ourselves in the blurred stage. And we'll mess up people because we're in the blur. If this man would have lied and pretended about how well he could see, his miracle would have never been completed. And so the Lord challenged him, can you truly do a deep reflection and honest appraisal of who you are? And will you be clear with it with me? Because if you will be clear in your words and your honesty to me, I will open your eyes to a world you've never seen. And that's what I feel like the Spirit's trying to tell us and unfinished. If we will get honest with the power of his word, if we will get honest with the power of what he's done and what needs to happen in our lives, if we'll lay it on the altar, God will take us into a dimension we have never seen before. Raise your hands and love the Spirit all over this house. He let him out. He spit in his eyes. And then he asked him, can you see? He goes, I can, but not the way I should. Not the way I wish I could. Not the way I believe it's supposed to be. So I give you permission. Touch me again. I'm honest right now, touch me again. Lord, I pray for every person in this congregation, for every individual in this house that might be in the blur, for every one of us, Lord, that we were resisting who might, you leading us out. So Lord, we do a self-assessment today. There are people in both stages. There are people holding on to things and not being led, and there are other people in this house not being honest with the level of transformation. And it took so much courage to say to you after you had touched him twice, I'm better than I was, but I still am not like I should be. And the enemy doesn't want you honest. He wants you to move through the motions of religion. He wants you to be fake and pretend. He wants you to worry about the perception of other people when you get honest. 
Because when we are not honest with where we stand spiritually, we limit the finishing power of redemption. And Jesus offered the man the option to be satisfied with so far so good. Do you want more or are you satiated with the work I've already done? And I refuse to be better and not finished. I will choose honesty and be healed. I will not accept better and leave best on the table. Oh, I feel the spirit. I have not had enough of God changing me. I have not had enough of God transforming me. And I am not satisfied with all God has done in this church, in my life, and in this city. So I'm not going to guard my reputation. God, make me into what I need to be. I don't see all I should see. I don't see clearly. Oh, because when you try to make people believe that you see more than you can see, that you are more than you are, you live in a stage of incompletion and unfinished. You are touched but not whole. And I believe there's some people in this house today that would say, God, finish everything you began in our life completely. Humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, First Peter says. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Not me, because I am going to humble myself before the Lord, and he'll exalt me. That's what the scripture said. When I get honest, God will lift me. When I get my spirit right, God will elevate me. I want someone in this house to say, God, I love that I'm better but I want the best I love that you've led me out but I want something more and my mind will not be limited by ritual or tradition or habits or sin whatever I gotta leave I'm leaving and God I will be honest I am so much better but I am not finished stand to your feet let the spirit pray right now I don't know who this sermon's for But whoever it's for, you need to run to this altar right now. You need to walk up here and say, God, I don't know if you're holding on to a place God's been trying to pull you out of. And you need to let go of it today in repentance. I don't know if God's already touched you multiple times. But you are not where you need to be. And you are willing to be honest with the Spirit and say, Lord, finish me. I don't see the way I should see. I don't know if you're in a blurred stage and your your vision is obscured and out of alignment. I don't know who it is, but all oh, people are already coming. And you know what we don't do at Tampa Life? We don't look at them and say, ooh, look, they're in a bad way. You know what we do? Thank God for the courage it takes to walk to an altar and say to Jesus, I need to see better. I need to see clearly. I need more of you. I need a complete deliverance and I need my eyes opened. Oh, thank God for the courageous people that say God isn't finished with me yet. And he's going to finish what he started in my life. Lord, I'm praying for people in this house right now that the conviction of the Spirit would sweep through us all over this place. Oh, with your eyes closed and your hearts open, I want you to begin to tell the Lord, uh, whichever situation you're in, if you're holding on to a past and you know you got to let go, I want you to let go of it right now. Say, God, I'm letting go. Lead me. Give him permission to lead you somewhere you've never been. If he's already touched you and you've already had an experience with him, but you know you are not seeing clearly what he wants and intends for you to see, then I want you to tell him, say, Lord, I'm being honest right now. I'm struggling with some things, some thought processes, some some ideas, some mentality, some abuse, some failures, some frustrations, some fear, some habits, some actions, some lifestyle choices. And I'm asking you, God, to make me whole. Forgive me. I'm getting honest with you right now. Hear the voice of the Lord asking you all over this house right now. Forgive me, God, for the blur. Forgive me for not being honest and saying, I can't quite see the way I need to see. Forgive me for the things within my heart and my mind that obscure you completely. I want to go somewhere I've never been in your spirit, God. So I ask you, God, as I do an honest appraisal of me, 
My faith isn't strong enough. And my heart isn't pure enough. So forgive me for my impure thoughts and my impure heart. Take me where I've never been. Let me see what I have never seen. In the name of Jesus. We've had so many prophecies that God would take this church places that we've never seen and others have never seen. But I believe the determining factor on going where we've never been is leaving behind where we used to be and being honest about where we are so that we can move into something new. All over this house, from the back to the front, raise those hands and talk to the Lord about where you are right now. God, I want to go somewhere I've never been. Spiritually, I want to walk in places I have not walked. I want to have a vision that is clear, unfettered, and unlimited by the affairs of this life. I want my life to be good ground. I want your seed to bring a harvest in my good ground. So cleanse my eyes and cleanse my spirit. Open my mind. Oh, the Spirit of God is in this house beautifully right now. Forgive my sins. Forgive my failures. Forgive my mistakes. Oh, somebody repent all over this house. Somebody talk to the Lord. Somebody get honest with Him about where you are. Lord, we don't put on masks here. We don't put on pretense or pretend or artificial lives but we want to move into the supernatural in ways we've never moved we want our lives to be enriched by your glory so we leave things behind we let go of things and we get honest with you about where we are your grip will never let me slip Your hand will never let me go. Keep leading me, Jesus. Keep touching us, Jesus. Keep transforming us, Jesus. Come on, that's beautiful all over this house. Just keep talking to him. There are many praying. Put your hand on someone near you. If you're not praying personally, pray with someone near you. Let go, let go. Let go, let go, I'm waiting for you to choose to let go and make a move. Let go, let go, let go, let go, with arms open wide, I'm here, tell you down faith is, I choose faith. Broken heart.